Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you to this afternoon's Ambassadors Forum, which today features Ambassador Philip Rieker. Philip Rieker is a former U.S. Ambassador to Macedonia. He is now part of the Obama administration. He is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. It is a great pleasure to welcome Ambassador Rieker here today. I'm Klaus Lauris, and I'm the Richard M. Krasner Distinguished Professor in History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. I would like to thank Richard Kressner and the generous sponsors behind him for making this Ambassador's uh, Forum possible. The Ambassador's Forum brings to campus prominent and stimulating diplomats and politicians who give public lectures and conduct seminars and workshops uh, for our graduate students. The UNC community, and in particular our graduate and undergraduate students, thus have the opportunity to engage firsthand with international leaders and obtain insights into the practical application of their studies of economics, European studies, international relations, political science. Ambassador Rieke is a fourth dignitary who visits UNC Chapel Hill in the, in the context of our Ambassador's Forum. I'm very grateful for our Center for European Studies and EU Center of Excellence and for the Center for Slavic, Eurasian and Eastern European Studies for all the great help and support rendered. The videotaped talks and discussions in the framework of our Ambassadors Forum can be watched on our famous YouTube channel and via the websites of the Department of History and the, Department, uh, and the Center for European Studies. Once again, I would like to express my great pleasure in welcoming Ambassador Philip Rieke to the UNC in Chapel Hill. Ambassador Rieke is a career foreign service officer. He assumed his current position as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs in August 2011. He supervises the Office of South Central European Affairs and is responsible for US relations with Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia, Kosovo, Macedonia, Montenegro, and Serbia. These are quite a few countries, I must say. It must be difficult to keep track. But Filip Rieke is well acquainted with the countries of the former Yugoslavia. After all, he served as ambassador to Macedonia between 2008 and 2011. Before this, Philip served at the US Embassy in Iraq, another cushy job, I take it, and, <laughs> and he was the Deputy Chief of Mission uh, in Budapest, Hungary, uh, from 2004 to 2007. He also served as Deputy Spokesman and Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Public Affairs from 2000 to 2003. As a spokesman at large for the State Department, and before that, he traveled a lot, I believe. He gave plenty of talks and interviews on US foreign policy and diplomacy. Ambassador Rieke has a BA from Yale and an MBA from the Thunderbird School of International Management. In view of Ambassador Rieke's great expertise in European and Eurasian affairs, the Obama administration has decided that they can't, not, that they can't do without his experience. Ambassador Rieke will thus continue in his important position as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State during uh, President Obama's second term in office. Ambassador Rieke has kindly agreed to give a talk on the Balkans from war and ethnic cleansing to democratization and integration into Europe. After the ambassador's remarks, we will have a roundtable discussion. Dr. Robert Jenkins, the director of the Center for Slavic, Eurasian and Eastern European Affairs, and myself will question and perhaps interrogate the ambassador a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> After half an hour or so, we will open it to questions from you, the audience. Please feel encouraged to join in and ask lots of interesting and highly challenging questions, please. <laughs> and subsequently, there will be a uh, reception just outside this room. And that is, of course, something to be looked for uh, particularly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have the tremendous pleasure and great honor to present to you Ambassador Philip Rieke of the US uh, the Department of State. Thank you very much, Klaus. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here. Uh, those introductions always give me a chance to uh, check up on how my memory is doing uh, to hear my life story presented uh, uh, once again. Uh, but frankly, given my 20 years in the Foreign Service, uh, a career that I found uh, much more interesting than perhaps I even expected when I started, having thought I might do it for two or three years, uh, I must say that the opportunity to engage with audiences here at home, uh, as well as overseas, but the, the home audience is something that I found particularly worthwhile. So I'm delighted to uh, 
be here in Chapel Hill. Thank you for organizing this weather uh, for me. It's uh, just like a typical uh, winter's day in Sarajevo, uh, where actually the temperature is uh, likely around seven degrees, not uh, 70. Um, but it's a great opportunity to uh, use this transition period when Secretary of State Clinton is in her final days in office. In fact, she expects to leave the State Department this Friday, uh, wave goodbye, uh, at least for now. Uh, and we will welcome in short order um, the next Secretary of State, uh, Senator Kerry. I'm not sure if those of you uh, that have been watching the news today heard that he was confirmed by the full Senate, a vote of uh, 94 to 3, I believe, with one Senator voting uh, present uh, to give you um, just the latest news from there. So we welcome Senator Kennedy, uh, Senator Kerry, uh, who, of course, has been uh, for a few short years the senior senator from Massachusetts. As he himself said, he was the junior senator to uh, Senator Edward Kennedy uh, for so many years. 28 years he served in the Senate, uh, and he comes extremely well prepared, having been chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for the last uh, four years since uh, now Vice President Biden stepped down from that position. But having served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee for his entire 28 years, in the United States Senate. Uh, my colleagues who have met already with Secretary-designate Kerry have been extraordinarily impressed uh, by the briefings he's received. No papers, uh, diving in for crucial facts, um, interested in the broad spectrum of challenges that face uh, United States foreign policy makers as we move uh, well into the 21st century. Now, for Secretary Clinton, and soon to be Secretary Kerry, uh, the legacy of the Balkans, the former Yugoslavia, the wars that took place there just 20 years ago, uh, is still very much a part of the context in which we look at US foreign policy and, and overseas engagement, particularly uh, in Europe. Those that uh, will remember, and many of you as students in particular, are too young to uh, perhaps remember the the actual wars themselves, but will recall uh, the horrific nature of what happened uh, in cities like Sarajevo, just 500 miles from Vienna, uh, in other parts of the Balkans, as late as the uh, ethnic conflict in Macedonia in 2001, the Kosovo War in 1998-99. These were scenes that nobody expected uh, in Europe in the post-World War II era. We thought we had left behind ethnic cleansing, uh, concentration camps, with the defeat of Nazi Germany in, in 1945. And with the end of the Cold War, there was a hope for uh, a great new prosperity, stability, uh, peace throughout all of Europe. The effort to make a Europe whole, free, at peace, democratic, and increasingly prosperous has been the key focal point of US policy in Europe essentially since 1945. And so the opportunity to uh, speak a little bit about uh, the collapse of Yugoslavia, to look at uh, the Balkans, uh, and at the title of the, the talk was From War and Ethnic Cleansing to Democratization and Integration to Europe, is particularly uh, timely right now. And that's not only because it's two decades since we witnessed this ethnic cleansing, but if you look at where we are in 2013, a century ago, in 1913, uh, the Balkan region was already engulfed in a lot of horrific war. Uh, 1913 was the year that saw the end of the first Balkan war, the beginning of the second Balkan war, and of course that was the precursor to, in 1914, uh, what some called the Third Balkan War, which eventually became the Great War, World War I, which not only forever changed uh, Europe uh, as it knew it, the world order, uh, but also brought the United States back across the Atlantic Ocean to engage in Europe, and we have been there in many ways uh, ever since. So I think uh, it's an opportunity, as every transition is, to reflect a bit upon uh, the past, the century that has gone by, uh, as well as looking to the future. And that applies very much uh, in the Balkans. It's true that the 20th century was a turbulent time uh, for the region. 
a hundred years ago, the Balkans, the entire area, was struggling to overcome the dying vestiges of Ottoman rule. Nationalist movements, whether Bulgarian or Albanian, Serbian, Macedonian, they were falling in and out of alliances with Europe's great powers as they sought to realize their own aspirations. And the battles that uh, took place in the Balkan Wars and then in the First World War, which introduced really mechanized warfare over borders that set the stage, as I said, for Gavril Princip's assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo in 1914, uh, was a precursor to uh, what we would see uh, 80 years later uh, at the end of the Cold War with the breakup of Yugoslavia. Now, I don't want to give a history lecture with all respect to the history professors, but I think it is important to uh, look at uh, how the legacy of what happened in the Balkans 100 years ago affected everything that followed. Certainly the rise and then fall and collapse of Yugoslavia, remembering that the 20 years since the end of Yugoslavia uh, is a mere blip in terms of Balkan history. The region is very much moving on and moving forward, but dealing with it on a daily basis, I can see that the tragedies of the 1990s, as well as those events of a century ago, uh, indeed impact uh, what goes on still today. And the people of that region have still not fully come to terms with those events. The United States has engaged in the region, as you know, uh, since we, with our European partners, uh, entered uh, into diplomacy to bring an end to uh, the horrific Balkan Wars of uh, the 1990s. And uh, Richard Holbrook, of course, leading US diplomatic efforts uh, in the Dayton peace talks, uh, ended a war and brought a peace that uh, remains in Bosnia. But now in 2013, I think it's natural that we look back a little uh, at the Balkans of 100 years ago and determine what has changed and what progress has really been made. And then in looking to the future, which is what diplomats try to do using history as a base, determine what kind of future we all want for the region. Most importantly, what the people of the region want. Hopefully a future that is stable, peaceful, and, and prosperous. It's worth remembering that the history and geography and culture of the Balkans are part of the soul of Europe. There is no Europe without the Balkans, though sometimes, and I see it on a regular basis, tired policymakers in Brussels and other European capitals really wish it were so. All of this is, is why the Balkans uh, continues to be a priority for the US government. Uh, certainly for Secretary Clinton, it remained a priority, even if you don't see it on the front pages as you might have uh, a decade or two decades ago. Secretary Clinton made 40, 40 trips to Europe in her four years as Secretary of State. One of the last of those, the 39th trip, was indeed a, a trip to the Balkans where she visited five of the countries uh, for which I'm responsible. She wanted to do this, it was a priority for her, and she did it in conjunction with uh, Baroness Catherine Ashton of the United Kingdom, who is the European Union's high representative and vice president for foreign uh, policy, sort of her, her Europe, EU equivalent, if you will. And they traveled to three countries together, to Serbia, to Kosovo, and to Bosnia, to deliver a message that the United States and the European Union uh, still care about this region, are concerned and disappointed about the lack of, project, of progress in some ways, uh, but are deeply united in our joint efforts uh, to find a future where every country can choose a path uh, to integration in Euro-Atlantic institutions, where the rule of law has primacy, uh, and that remains very much a part of our regional policy, part of our bilateral policy with each of these countries individually, and part of our broader engagement with the European Union. It's something we've invested in. Those of you who will recall uh, deployment of, of NATO troops, uh, a tremendous amount of aid uh, that has been put in to help build institutions, to help demonstrate through American experience, American know-how, uh, that it is possible to use your diversity 
in terms of ethnic and religious groupings as a strength, as we've sought to do in our own country, uh, and the integration of the entire region into these Euro-Atlantic institutions, NATO, the European Union, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, we see that as the best means of ensuring long-term peace and stability and prosperity. Now, during my three years as U.S. Ambassador in Macedonia, I very much focused on this. Macedonia faces a special problem. Uh, it is an independent country for almost 20 years, just over 20 years. The first time as an independent country, it was fought over. And indeed, in 1913, uh, when the Second Balkan War came to an end through the Treaty of Bucharest, one of the big questions that remained was known as the Macedonia question. This area of land, geographically part of uh, the historical kingdom of, of Macedonia from ancient times, uh, but not directly related to that, uh, had been fought over, uh, province of the Ottoman Empire, it, pieces claimed by Serbia, by Bulgaria, by Greece, by Albania. Uh, today, we feel like we've answered uh, the Macedonia question with the country to which I was accredited as ambassador. It is a relatively small country, uh, a constitutional democracy, multi-ethnic, multi-religious, uh, based on the rule of law. And yet it still struggles uh, with an issue uh, with its southern neighbor, Greece in particular, over the name of the country. Uh, and that is a, a problem that uh, 20 years since its independence, uh, it still finds holding it back from integration uh, into NATO and the European Union. So these problems persist, even though they're not on the front, front page. Secretary Clinton and uh, Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs, Phil Gordon, as uh, Klaus indicated, asked me to come back from Macedonia uh, and engage more broadly. For my work in one Balkan country, I was suddenly handed seven Balkan countries. What I did to deserve that, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but nevertheless, over the last 18 months, uh, I have been spending much of that time traveling in those countries because the personal relationships, the engagement with uh, their political leaders, as well as trying to understand those countries, working closely with our embassies, uh, is vitally important. Uh, I talk to civil society leaders because uh, we don't believe that the politicians in any country, uh, and certainly not in the Balkans, have all the answers. It's important to reach out to civil society as well, to non-governmental organizations, to academics, to think tanks, um, to social organizations of all types. Uh, we discuss what's being done to develop democratic, stable societies in their countries. We work uh, with our embassies to focus our aid and assistance programs. We talk about economic development, what steps can be taken to increase financial stability, encourage trade, investment. We talk about the regional relations, which are so crucial, getting along with their neighbors, what practical things can be done to bring lasting reconciliation. And fundamentally, how can the United States help in all these areas? We focus on rule of law, as I said, the institutions, courts, prosecutors, uh, so that potential investors can feel confident in uh, carrying out business relations, commercial activity in these countries, because we see that as the future to longer term stability. And we talk about responsible leadership, where the country should take priority, not the political party. And all too often, we don't see citizens in the driver's seat. In many ways, the communist era under Tito's Yugoslavia has never been fully exercised from uh, any of these countries. It's something that clearly takes generational change uh, for young people to understand how the world works, how it can work, and to uh, get out of the vestiges of uh, the history that they've experienced. I think we want to make sure that the tragedies of the past, whether of 100 years ago uh, or 20 years ago, uh, are not repeated. Future political and economic stability in each one of these Balkan countries and in the region as a whole, we believe is important to US national interests. As I said, you're talking about countries that are just uh, short drives from major European capitals. Uh, countries like Croatia and Albania are already allies in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Uh, 
Slovenia, uh, the first country of the former Yugoslavia to join the European Union, has advanced much quicker and is also a member of NATO. But each of these countries has expressed their interest in becoming uh, a member of the European Union. And we think that that is the force that will bring the stability and the potential prosperity. If you take a step back and you look at what Western Europe has accomplished since 1945, uh, even through the difficult period of, of the Cold War, which perhaps provided a, a certain amount of stability to allow us to move forward, uh, the European Union and the consolidation of institutions in that framework has allowed an unprecedented period of, of peace and stability. Who would have thought in 1945, at the end of World War II, that Germany and France would not only not go to war again, but would be such close partners? Historically speaking, who would have expected that Britain and Spain would become close partners and not be at war with each other? Even Nordic countries, Denmark and Sweden, uh, look at their long-term history. So the European Union has provided a basis for these countries to work together, where their differences can be used together as strengths, where what started out as an economic community expanded to a, a political level. Now, all of you here in the news these days that the European Union is facing its own challenges. I think that's natural. It's reached a point in its uh, evolution, its growth, its addition of, of new members, many of those coming from uh, a different context, the countries in Central and Eastern, European, Eastern Europe that have emerged uh, from the Cold War, from perhaps Soviet domination, or in the case of the Balkans, uh, the complexity of Yugoslavia. Uh, these are all things that the EU has to deal with, as well as the global economic situation and the challenges of uh, the Eurozone crisis. I believe strongly, and it's, it's our contention, that the EU uh, will prevail uh, and is a solid force for moving forward. Uh, and we work uh, primarily in the European Bureau uh, to partner with the European Union in dealing with global challenges uh, all over the world, but in the EU's own backyard in the Balkans. I think it's not at all altruistic. Uh, it's something that is in US interests. The more the countries of the Balkans become stable, prosperous democracies, part of the European family, the more they can also be our partners in dealing with the major challenges and, and opportunities that we have in the early 21st century. In the Middle East, embracing the Arab Spring, dealing with Syria, uh, what we've seen in Afghanistan, even in our engagement in Iraq. Uh, countries of the Balkans became exporters of peace uh, exporters of security instead of consumers of security. In Iraq, when I served there, uh, there were small deployments from Macedonia, from Bosnia, from uh, Croatia, from other countries uh, who were participating shoulder to shoulder with our soldiers. And actually, uh, through the training that uh, much of it we had provided, were contributing greatly. General Petraeus, I remember saying to me uh, that the troops from Macedonia, although small in number, but one of the highest per capita contributions from any allied country in that effort were some of the best soldiers he had uh, of those participating with us in Iraq because they came uh, well prepared, dedicated to, uh, to the endeavor, but also without the caveats that many of our other allies had. These troops were ready to go, as they say, outside the wire to participate with us. And in fact, there was a great competition among American units uh, or who got to work with, for instance, uh, the Macedonians. There are clear ways that the United States can continue to help in the region, uh, not as a patriarchal figure um, or because we have all the, the answers, but as I said, we're willing to share our own experiences and share by example, whether at a military level or the lessons we've learned about the importance of uh, separation of uh, powers in, in government, independent judiciary, for instance. We provide assistance, uh, although the levels of aid have dropped considerably from uh, the days in the 90s and, and the early part of uh, the 21st century, to help these countries learn from their own mistakes, learn from our mistakes, and take the best of our examples. Uh, I think there's a bright future for a number of these countries in, in the Balkans, where the diversity of the region 
can be a strength, um, but reaching it is certainly no easy task. Those of us who work on these issues know that the Euro-Atlantic integration is a long and slow process, which has become slower because of the challenges the European Union is facing. Uh, but we do continue to engage and encourage each of these countries to make the reforms still needed, particularly in the area of rule of law. And we have seen some real progress. You can look, uh, uh, as I said, at NATO, where Slovenia joined both the European Union and NATO in 2004. Um, and countries like Little Montenegro, which regained its independence, just 600,000 people, one of the smallest countries in Europe, uh, regained the independence it lost in 1918 uh, and is now in the stage of negotiating its entrance into the European Union and hopes to join NATO as soon as the alliance is ready to expand uh, to additional partners. Croatia. Uh, who you will recall from horrible headlines just uh, 20 years ago, is set to become the newest EU member in July. Uh, as I said, Macedonia is a candidate for EU membership uh, and for NATO, and if they can solve their name issue with Greece, they are bound to uh, join both of those. Serbia has also made considerable progress in recent years. They've enacted some key reforms, They've cooperated with the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, having captured indicted war criminals like Karadzic and Mladic. Uh, it's on the cusp of uh, starting EU negotiations. It became a candidate country at the end of last year, much of that due to Secretary Clinton's personal efforts to engage and encourage Serbia and Kosovo to normalize their relations so that the European Union uh, and its criteria of good neighborly relations would allow Serbia to move forward. Bosnia and Herzegovina saw some progress at the beginning of 2012, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, has stagnated. I don't think they're on the edge of violence again, but what you see is leaders who are more concerned about their own personal agendas than actually moving the country forward. The challenges that come from wartime legacies, of course, are not exclusive or unique to the Balkans. France and Germany and other countries throughout Europe, as I said, have proved multiple times that positive change can happen. Countries that once fought physical battles are now, now battling over shared issues in the European Union, like the Euro or the United Kingdom, debating whether it will remain in the European Union after 2017. This is the vision that we share with the Western Balkan countries. And we can help them not only imagine a future without armed conflict, but we can help them bring it about. And I believe that as long as Europe and America are united, as long as the countries of the region desire to be part of the Euro-Atlantic community, then we will only advance closer to fulfilling the mutual goal, a stable and prosperous region bringing together a whole and peaceful Europe. So let me just finish by noting that historical anniversaries, uh, whether 100 years, 20 years, uh, whether uh, of independence, like the Albanians who just celebrated their 100 years of, of independence, or anniversaries of wars, they give us a cause to reflect. From 1913 to 1993 to 2013, the difference in the Balkans is unmistakable. It used to be that the fate of the Balkans was determined by the great powers and by empires of the past. But today, the difference is that every one of these countries is a democracy, and the people have a voice and can use it. How they use it is still a question. And as countries and as individuals, they can determine their own future. They are choosing, by and large, the path towards stability and prosperity, what we call the European path. And the United States is very much a part of that European path for the countries of the Western Balkans. This, we believe, is the indelible future of the Balkans. There are a number of great challenges, but my key message to you tonight is that we are still engaged, we're still determined, and we are still very much dedicated to partnering not only with the people and the institutions of the countries of South Central Europe, the Western Balkans, but also with 
our European partners in seeing this endeavor through. So thanks for your attention. I look forward to the opportunity for some tough grilling. Absolutely. And uh, I really appreciate uh, your interest tonight, and I encourage you all to uh, follow the Balkans, but also follow the, the State Department. It's an exciting time for us as we shift after four years with a truly dynamic uh, separate Secretary of State, a uh, new Secretary coming in in just a few days. Um, it's a time of enormous challenges all over the world. You see it in the headlines. Uh, we have to work as a, as a diplomatic institution, the State Department, with our colleagues from the military, from the intelligence community, from the academic world, from the non-governmental world. But most of all, uh, we need to make sure we're doing a good job of informing uh, our own fellow citizens, uh, particularly the young and the students, encouraging them to take an interest uh, in the world around them, an interest in foreign policy, and how the United States engages in uh, what are small and large, but all of them challenges that affect our future. So thanks, thanks very, much. very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for a very enlightening overview. We appreciate what you had to say about the importance of being involved in world affairs, and in the Balkans in particular. But come to think of it, there are plenty of problems all over the world, and the United States is involved in many, if not most of them, or all of them, almost, uh, Syria and their domestic problems, uh, immigration problems, economic problems. So, and the Balkans are really not, uh, you know, it's a European uh, area. So, let me be devil's advocate. Should the United States really be involved in the Balkans? Shouldn't it really be a European affairs? Why not let the Europeans deal with it? <laughs> what, does the, what the hell is the United States doing in the Balkans? Well, believe me, there are days, <laughs> particularly when I wake up there and I ask the same question. Um, <laughs> no, I, th I think, uh, as I indicated, um, the United States is a European power in many ways. Uh, our history, uh, our economy, our common security, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, the most successful, arguably, uh, uh, alliance in, in history, is fundamental to uh, everything we do. Our largest investors, our largest investments, for all the talk of, of uh, China and the economic role they play, obviously enormous, you know, the biggest investors are still Europeans. Uh, our investments are still European directed. Uh, and so while we look at the whole world, and we have to, we do that with our European partners. And what we learned going back 100 years when we engaged in World War I, and then came back again uh, after the horrors of, of World War II, uh, was that we need to be there and engaged. We need to constantly reevaluate how we do that engagement. And I think what we hit on with the Balkans was a realization in the 1990s that the Europeans, whether as the EU institutionally or as individual countries, and certainly those countries involved in the conflicts in the Balkans, were unable to resolve it themselves due to historical facts, cultural challenges. Uh, they needed the United States, and they will admit that. And so we engaged because we realized it was in our interest to maintain stability, security, uh, and peace in Europe. Like I said, if you have a disintegration of, of, uh, of the stability in South Central Europe, that's 500 miles from Vienna. When does that affect other things? Uh, look at what's happened in Greece over the past two years, economically, and what that's meant socially, uh, what, what that could potentially mean. Turkey, an enormous trading partner, a vitally important country with cultural and historical links to the region. All of this says we need to pay attention to this. Is it the top priority? No. And certainly it doesn't get treated that way in the State Department. Uh, and you're hard pressed to dig through uh, the media, perhaps do a search in the internet, and you can find mention of the issues I deal with every day. 20 years ago, these were the top issues of the moment, what was happening in Bosnia. Now we have to look further afield. But if we can solidify the stability in the rest of Europe that we've seen in Western Europe, and increasingly throughout Central and into Eastern Europe, uh, that is a good thing for us. And so we need to balance all of these priorities, and every day is a, is a, a balancing act. But maintain our engagement, uh, see this through, it's the unfinished business of Europe, 
And I think uh, we're fortunate that every president, regardless of uh, party affiliation, has seen the wisdom of finishing that unfinished business. Thanks very much. Paul, do you want to come in? Um, first of all, let me thank uh, you and Dr. Lieber for coming here. It's a, it's a real treat to have someone with your uh, experience and expertise here on campus um, for, for myself and uh, a few of us who follow uh, the Balkans on a regular basis and my students who I subject to the London Balkans on a regular basis. It's a great opportunity to, to learn more and to engage at a very substantial level. Um, I got lots of questions, but let me start with the kind of general one. You have spoken uh, in your remarks, and uh, earlier today I heard you speak, uh, of the partnership between the EU and the, and the US uh, toward policy in, uh, in Southeast Europe. Uh, I wonder to what extent you mentioned uh, meeting with um, High Representative Ashton on these issues. I wonder to what extent you actually see um, differences within the EU. Uh, we know that, that there's an attempt over time by the EU to increase uh, the institutionalization of a kind of central policy, mm -hmm. but it's still key uh, states that often have a very loud voice, particularly in bilateral relations in the region. Uh, and I, I wonder to what extent uh, they're all singing from the same song sheet, uh, or whether there aren't actually uh, differences that, uh, that get masked over and uh, how how do you policy deals with those kind of No, it's a terrific question because it is very timely and it cuts to the whole concept of the European Union, uh, which is, of course, made up of all of these, in many ways, very different states, culturally different, religiously different, complicated histories with each other, and yet they each have undergone an enormous number of reforms to align their legal structures, their regulatory structures, to change some of their patterns of behavior to, to work together. Uh, it doesn't mean they give up their unique qualities. In fact, the concept of the EU, of, of Europe, is one that says that the diversity is a strength, uh, and working together, uh, particularly in a 21st century world where you have uh, the United States, you have Europe, you have China, you have these emerging powers, uh, that they have to be able to, to work together uh, while well respecting their history and the differences. As you can imagine, that's incredibly complex and different. And I think we'd be foolish to paper over or pretend uh, that everything is smooth in the EU. They are still evolving. They are still developing their institutions. The uh, European External Action Service, which is essentially their State Department, their foreign policy arm, headed by Catherine Ashton. She's the first high representative uh, and vice president uh, of the European Union in this role, that's still evolving. That emerged from the Lisbon Treaty, which enhanced European uh, partnership and, and joint efforts in a common uh, security and defense policy. And they're still learning how to do that. Uh, there's a European Commission, which operates separately from the External Action Service. They have to deal with a European Parliament. Uh, and we know how complicated it can be to work between Congress and the executive branch and the different institutions uh, that work to implement policy. Uh, and then they have the 28 member states, uh, the 28 when, when Croatia joins, um, all of which have their own politics at home. And that politics often uh, attacks the European Union from one side or another. So it's, it's very uh, complex. What we've seen on the issues in the Balkans is that member states, Germany is a prime example, the United Kingdom, others, have become a little skeptical about enlargement. So the premise of, of EU, EU membership, and the path towards EU, which was such a draw for countries in the, in the 90s, in the early part of uh, the 2000s, um, has lost a little of its, its luster. The member states are maybe not as eager to take in more members. How much does it cost? Are these countries ready? And are those countries themselves as driven by what they see as squabbling and economic challenges uh, within the EU? So this is why I spend uh, as much time as I spend in the Balkans uh, working bilaterally and on regional issues. I spend an awful lot of time in Brussels with the institutions and then time in individual capitals, whether it's Berlin, 
working with the Germans, whether it's London, coordinating with our British colleagues, um, going to the conferences where we hash out and think about this stuff, sometimes in long, drawn out processes. It's really important to have uh, those conversations, to understand the priorities and to reassure them of our dedication, but yet they have to be in the lead. We don't have a vote in the European Union or an EU enlargement, but I can tell you that the EU as a whole and the individual member states pay a lot of attention to what we say and what we think. They hang on every word President Obama says, not just about Europe, but about the world at large, because they see that as vital to their interests. Uh, and as much as we can have differences, uh, they see us as, as critical to maintaining uh, stability, not only in Europe, but around the world. To follow, to follow up on that, uh, when you're in your office in DC, there's the EU delegation in DC, and there are all the many different individual uh, uh, embassies from various countries in Europe. So who do you deal with on, let's say, Kosovo or Bosnia or other or Serbia, other issues? And is there a, you know, a rivalry between these embassies and the EU delegation? And can you pick and choose and basically shape policy like that? Well, it's interesting. Uh, it's good that you bring that up. There is the, the EU delegation. They are, of course, responsible for administering the centers of excellence, which I think is a, a wonderful uh, endeavor um, to help explain the EU, to help them understand better the United States. I will go and give briefings uh, periodically at the European delegation's uh, mission in Washington. And of course, that means that a representative from each of the member state embassies comes and, and joins that briefing. So you may have uh, 20 or 26 uh, all, all join uh, to hear what I have to say. They're going to report back to their capitals. At the same time, I will get calls from uh, the ambassadors or other officials from the individual embassies. They also want to hear. I'm in regular contact, whether it's email or conference calls, sometimes video uh, conferences, with my colleagues from the EU institutions in Brussels, but also from uh, the key member states. We have an informal association structure known as the Quint of the five countries that work closely on the Western Balkans, that is the United States, along with Britain, France, Germany, and Italy. Uh, so those countries I'm in particular contact with. But there are other countries that have historic interests, uh, whether it's Austria. Uh, Sweden, for instance, has had a long interest, partially because of their own engagement uh, in the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. Um, their foreign minister, Carl Bildt, was very uh, involved and knowledgeable, um, was a high representative in, uh, in Bosnia. Uh, some of the countries that are surrounding the Balkans, Hungary and others, have a great interest. So I've tried to engage them so that it's a constant balancing act. And that's a lot of what our diplomacy is. We don't have secrets from each other, particularly. It's a matter of communication and trying to make sure everybody understands what our position is, uh, how we want to help and engage, but what we expect from them as well. And there are times when I have to say, look, we're just not going to be able to uh, engage or solve this problem. We'll look to the EU to take the lead, but we're ready to help and let us know when and how to help. And I think we've developed a fairly good communication in that regard. That may be one of the reasons that the Balkans isn't on the front page every day. Yeah, just, just following up uh, from my side as well. Since uh, the Zagreb summit in 2000, uh, the general policy for, for the European Union has been uh, built around the stabilization association process and uh, the old name of uh, EU accession for states in the region, and I think uh, it's safe to say that uh, particularly in the last decade, um, but even as far back as 2000, U.S. policy has mirrored that. Um, so we've essentially got a singular policy that says uh, the solution to everything is, is moving toward EU accession. Uh, as you noted in your talk, some of that luster has worn off, uh, and then as I regularly read uh, and note and, and talk with my students, there are two places in particular where there are fundamental structural problems to that. One, of course, is Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, where uh, a strong central state is a necessary prerequisite um, for EU accession, and there are lots of institutionalized interests uh, that are blocking that kind of state creation. 
Uh, and the other is uh, the issue of Kosovo, where disputes between Serbia and Kosovo over sovereignty uh, continues to, to not only uh, create instability in the region, but divide the European Union itself. Mm -hmm. We're twenty two of the member states have recognized Kosovo's independence and, and five haven't. So to what extent are there any alternatives, or do we just have to wait out this long process uh, of, uh, you know, eventually, hopefully generations will change, uh, the mm -hmm. economic crisis will end, the EU will start growing, its appeal may come back to potential uh, member states, uh, and the situation will change, or is there actually some kind of incentives, new incentives, new policy change that we could come in? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a, a good question, and it's one we do ask ourselves, actually, uh, quite often in our ter internal dialogue and also with our, our European partners. And indeed, with individual uh, countries, with the leaders of, of the countries of the Balkans. I used to have a regular conversation with uh, um, leaders in, in Macedonia uh, when I was ambassador there, and they're faced with these challenges which have blocked uh, their accession to NATO and uh, their progress on the European path, uh, and they haven't resolved uh, their issues with Greece. And I've said, perhaps provocatively, what is your alternative? And I know some have said, well, we'll be like Switzerland. Uh, you know, Switzerland, independent, uh, we'll just pursue our own role. Now, Switzerland prides itself on that independence, but it's a unique situation. And I don't know a single country in the Balkans that has Switzerland's banks, uh, its watchmakers, or even its chocolate. So I'm not sure that the Swiss model is, is the right way. It's not perfect. The European Union uh, integration into these institutions is, is not necessarily perfect. Um, but we haven't found other alternatives. Um, Serbia, as an example, has not expressed an interest in, in joining NATO. Uh, and that's not surprising. I mean, NATO was bombing Serbia just over a decade ago, 13 years ago. Uh, and you can go to Belgrade, and they still have buildings that were bombed, the, the old defense ministry and others. They've left them up just to remind people of that. Um, but at the same time, they're very interested in having a good professional military-to-military -military relationship with NATO because they realize that that kind of engagement and communication is, is key. So what are the alternatives? What can we, the United States, do for these countries? I can tell you, and many of you may have experienced this yourself, you go to countries overseas, um, countries of the former Yugoslavia that look to the United States as uh, you know, a, a golden uh, goal, at the same time with mixed views because they were brought up in the Yugoslav era to see the United States and NATO as, as a threat. Yugoslavia was special. It was between East and West. It was the third way, the non-aligned movement. And so they're a bit conflicted over this. And yet when we don't have all the answers or solve their problems, uh, their own political problems or their economic problems, they can often be frustrated. And I say to them, here's what we can do for you. We have our own challenges. We have to make policy based on what we think is in our best interest, yours and mine. That's fundamentally what policy is about. What is going to protect US uh, security, uh, economic security um, in terms of prosperity, and reflect our broad values in terms of democracy, respect for human rights. So here's what we can do for you. We, can, we, we aren't going to make you the 51st state, which some of them will seriously talk about. Why not just, you know, the Kosovars will tell you that. We could just be another state. It's not going to happen. Uh, we can help you to build institutions that meet the requirements of the EU membership and bring you into these structures. Now, that in and of itself isn't a solution to anything. But it gives you an opportunity. It gives you a context in which to pursue uh, the best interests of your country individually. Like I said, the model shows that the EU, European integration, has uh, kept countries that for centuries were constantly going to war with each other, has kept them not only uh, out of wars with each other, but working together to build uh, a greater stability and an extraordinary 
level of prosperity. That's what we can offer you, is an opportunity to do that. The countries themselves, each one of them, has got to make the decision if, whether they're going to use the political capital necessary as a society, make the changes necessary uh, to reflect that. Are you going to, uh, as a society, accept rule of law as being a critical factor so that you deal with corruption? Because that's crucial to being able to move forward. Are you going to put in place regulations and laws that provide a level playing field for potential foreign investors? If you don't, not that many investors are going to come. That's a simple rule of, of the markets. If you try to convince a, a company, whether it's American or Swiss or uh, Chinese, to come and invest in uh, some small country in the Balkans, they're going to have to be convinced that that investment is safe and has a balance. And so this is what we're offering. Experience, advice, uh, some expertise, put it together and come with us on this path. It's not a quick path, and that's become frustrating to some who want instant gratification. But we haven't found a, a plan B for that. Uh, if, if I may, um, I, you know, I think that that's a, a, a viewpoint that works wonderfully well for many countries. Uh, and you can't force, uh, some, as you said earlier today, you can't force uh, you know, the water, but you can't make drink. Uh, the one exception, perhaps, or two, the one in particular is, is Bosnia and Herzegovina, where, in fact, we, the United States, is responsible for the institutional structure there because it comes out of the Dayton Agreement. Uh, and it seems to me that we've created an institutional structure that blocks change. Uh, and so waiting for Bosnian politicians to come to us and say it themselves could be an extremely long process. So that may be uh, one place where the U.S. actually has to think about alternatives. Uh, you know, I've heard the European Commission say, we'll give them the opportunity, they just have to take it themselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, right now, they don't have much incentive to do that because they've got a very cushy institutional structure that relies on uh, ethnic division to reproduce the politics in the situation. And so I don't see how we get out of that institutional structure very easily. Well, it's an interesting uh, conundrum, and I think Bosnia is, is the toughest uh, right now. Um, perhaps uh, briefly outline the structure? Of the yeah, I mean, um, the point is that peace was brought to Bosnia. The war was ended through the Dayton Accords, which created uh, a structure uh, which, to sum it up, basically creates one state, Bosnia and Herzegovina, two entities, so the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is predominantly Bosniaks or, or uh, the Muslim uh, Bosnians and ethnic Croats, um, and the Republika Srpska, which is predominantly uh, ethnic Serb. But both of those entities have lots of uh, citizens from uh, the other ethnic groups, and, and that is the key to it as well. Three what's known as constituent peoples, Bosniaks, Croats, and Serbs. The European Court of Human Rights has already found that, you know, this isn't exactly fair. What if you don't belong to one of those groups? You're sort of disenfranchised, not in terms of your vote, but how to participate. So that's one aspect. To meet the human rights requirements, they're going to have to do something. It's a case called the Sedic Finci case. Uh, two guys, a, a Jew and a, um, a Roma, uh, sued and said, you know, this isn't fair. And the European Court of Human Rights said, you're right. They're going to have to change that in order to move forward in the European path. This structure ended a war. It was never necessarily meant to uh, be around forever. It created a basic constitution that indeed allows them to function. It doesn't preclude functioning better. It doesn't preclude better governance. But that takes a will which is not found in the political leaders across the board of any of the ethnic groups, of any of the political parties. The country has never fully divested itself of its communist legacy. The economic means of the country are still held and controlled, state-run companies, by political parties and politicians. And so until people are willing to say, wait a minute, we're tired of this. We have the right to vote. 
but our choices are, are not performing uh, for us or on our behalf, there's not a lot we can do. We have made attempts. There have been several attempts over the years to have constitutional reform, to make changes. Some of them have come very close to doing that. Uh, but nothing has so far uh, actually been accepted by all. And that's why the country is stagnating. Um, I don't see the ability of us, the United States, even in conjunction with our European partners, and again, this is where differences within the EU come to the fore. Some of the member states have different views of how we should approach Bosnia. I don't see us having the ability or the, the political uh, investment that it would take to undertake again to force through some change across uh, Bosnia, unless it's something that the Bosnians, all of them, decide to do. And that's where they are a democracy. They have an opportunity to do this and hold their own leaders accountable. And we are still there, ready to engage uh, and let them see the rewards of working together. We've set criteria. If you do this, you move one step closer on the path to NATO. And so far, they, they haven't been able to do that. So uh, we're very much engaged, offering ideas, not uh, directing them, because we really can't. Uh, and you know, one can even debate the premise that is our responsibility. We help them stop killing each other by sending our troops there, uh, which proved to be a positive thing. Uh, it stopped horrors that uh, nobody expected to see uh, in Europe again in the 20th century. Um, but we simply can't live their lives for them. Uh, and so where does colonialism stop and simply uh, an extended hand begin? And that's kind of what we face. Uh, it's a question of responsible leadership, stepping up to their, their own responsibilities. Thank you. Let me briefly go back to Kosovo. Kosovo is now independent, though not recognized by many countries in the world, including some European Union countries. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, if, was that really the only option forward to have independence for Kosovo? Is Kosovo, if you withdraw Kofor, is it really a viable country even for economic reasons? And also, isn't, doesn't it serve as a model case for Catalonia, for Scotland? So is it really the solution to the European Union for countries to split up increasingly? Uh, was there not another option for Kosovo? You know, I think a lot of other options were looked at in Kosovo. You had a situation where uh, an autonomous province uh, within the former Yugoslavia was stripped of that autonomy. Uh, a population that was 90% ethnic Albanian, uh, which was, let's face it, not treated well uh, by the capital at that time, Belgrade. You ended up, as was predictable, uh, with essentially a war. Um, the Kosovo Liberation Army uh, and after Milosevic began to expel uh, the Kosovars, NATO intervened to end that, brought a peace under a UN uh, Security Council resolution, and set about trying to find ways forward. There was no preordained determination that there would be independence. And in fact, a lot of Kosovars were very frustrated by that. Uh, but one of the challenges was uh, getting full engagement from Serbia from Belgrade to understand that you couldn't go back to the way things were. Politically, uh, psychologically, uh, too much had happened. I think it's a, a very false argument that is often used by some to sort of say, well, uh, Kosovo's independence then suggests that uh, Catalonia should uh, uh, be free to become independent. Are the people in Catalonia suggesting that their relationship with Madrid was like Kosovo's relationship with Belgrade? I don't think so. Well, when you ask the people, they may say that. Uh, and, and so I think you know, every situation has to be looked at uh, uh, in terms of its own context, its own viability. Um, the fact is that almost 100 countries around the world do recognize Kosovo. That's been frustrating and, and slower than some have uh, wanted largely because of Serbian efforts, extraordinary amounts invested in trying to block 
uh, recognition, convincing other countries on the basis of the old Yugoslav uh, ties and the non-aligned movement um, to not recognize Kosovo. I think that's very short-sighted. I think uh, they've got to accept that Kosovo is now a reality. And is it um, economically viable? And I think it's just as economically viable as any other country of two million people uh, in, uh, uh, in a tough region. Um, they're going to have to undertake reforms. They're going to have to make themselves attractive to investment. Um, they're going to have to deal with corruption. Uh, and they're not going to become Switzerland quickly. Uh, no, but never. they <laughs> they see themselves uh, and want to be on uh, a European trajectory. And they've actually made great progress in the last uh, year and a half, uh, two years. And right now, probably the most uh, exciting uh, diplomatic engagement uh, ongoing in the region is the dialogue, as it's called, that the European Union facilitates between Kosovo and Serbia to try to help them normalize relations. They're not asking Serbia to recognize Kosovo or its independence, but to have normal relations. Some people compare it to what East and West Germany did during the Cold War period, where neither of them recognized each other, but they understood that they had to work together for common goals. Uh, that's what the EU has asked, and the next couple of months are really crucial for that, both for Kosovo's future, but also for Serbia's ability to move forward in the European path. in the German case, there was unification. I can't see that between... No, Serbia it's the exact Kosovo. opposites, yeah. <laughs> yeah. One final thought. Well, a short one on that, and then I'll go with a different direction. Um, one of the exercises I do in my, my course on Yugoslavia is uh, uh, looking at the Balkans and 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 um, I, I'd be curious about uh, your response to that. And then I, I have a, a slightly different direction I'd like to have. You know, this comes up often. I, I think it's, um, it, it would be fundamentally um, impractical to have them join at the same time. A lot of people say they have to join at the same time because if they don't, if Serbia joins first, then they would block Kosovo from joining. Uh, I, I think that the problem with that is that Kosovo is understandably so far behind in the reforms. I mean, it was never an independent country. Serbia was the, the main republic. Belgrade was the capital of Yugoslavia, which had it stayed together, could have easily been the first new member of the European Union, and it would have an economy that could easily rival Poland's right now, something I wonder if uh, some of the people think about if they look back on, on what happened 20 years ago when, when it all fell apart. Um, so I think the EU is cognizant of this, and as Serbia moves forward in this process, if they're able to begin accession talks, meet the criteria for that, uh, the EU will have to be very creative about how they accept Serbia's membership. And it takes a number of years to go through the accession process um, so that it is accepted without their ability to block Kosovo, so that Kosovo uh, can take the longer time necessary to meet it as well. And that's something that can be done. You put the lawyers on it and let them figure it out. <laughs> so. Let me propose, we have one more question by you and then we open it up to questions from you as the audience. Uh, late last year, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia uh, in a couple of controversial cases um, acquitted uh, first Croatian general on appeal uh, for war crimes uh, against the Serb population in Croatia and then uh, in, a, in a slightly different case uh, acquitted for a retrial, retrial uh, a Kosovo politician uh, from the Kosovo Liberation Army who was also uh, accused of war crimes against uh, Serbs. Um, naturally, that led to a lot of uh, a large outcry from, from Serbia in particular about mm -hmm. injustice connected with, uh, with the ICTY. Do you think that's mostly symbolic politics and, uh, and uh, a play for a domestic audience or uh, do you think that there's something quite real to uh, uh, perhaps different standards by the ICTY towards uh, different victims? My own view is that it's, it's quite real to most of the Serbs who believe that, but I don't believe that's the case. Just as in any uh, judicial system uh, where there's rule of law uh, and you have judicial procedures with rules, prosecutions, cases that are made, and determinations made by judges or juries, you're going to get verdicts that seem wrong, with which you don't agree. Uh, the, the case here of General Gotovina, uh, the Croatian general who was charged 
uh, with war crimes and, and was acquitted. Uh, some have said that it was um, very poorly prosecuted. Um, you know, that's, that's what happens in independent judicial cases. You're not going to convince most Serbs of that. Most of them will believe that it was biased, that it's political. I mean, I know from my own very close contacts in Macedonia, they all believe that these are politically predetermined. There was some reason that uh, great powers off the United States decided that this will be the verdict there or that. I, I simply don't believe that, and I, I don't see it happen. The example I, I often point out, uh, which may resonate uh, with some of you, all those students, you guys are so young these days, but you remember the O.J. Simpson trial? Well, you know, O.J. was acquitted, and some people couldn't believe that. They thought that was just unbelievable, you know, outrageous. How is it possible? Well, that's what the, the judicial system uh, delivered. The fact of the matter is, through the civil courts, as you'll recall, uh, the family of, of uh, the, the murdered uh, people sued and basically bankrupted OJ. Interestingly, just this past week, a court in Croatia awarded to the survivors of a Serb family who were massacred uh, a civil uh, amount of money, I think about 100,000, 95,000 euros, which was quite uh, interesting. So the International Tribunal said this guy wasn't guilty of these crimes. The, the case wasn't made. And I can't tell you, because I'm not a lawyer and I didn't take a position in that, uh, he was acquitted. It's, it's what happened. This is not about collective guilt. It was about a particular case. And unfortunately, I think for, for most Serbs, there is a feeling um, that there was not fairness in that. And that will, will linger for a while. Thank you very much indeed. Perhaps I can ask you back to the podium and we'll open it up to questions Great, from sure. the audience. I think one thing we learned definitely from your talk and from answering our question is that everyone tries to be like Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> so, and when you go there, you realize why. Yeah. <laughs> indeed, there's so many cuckoo's clubs. That's true. Definitely. Well, my obviously can you, can I, sorry to interrupt you. Can I ask you to introduce you briefly, and if you have an affiliation with any official institution, please say that, say your name, and keep your questions kind of sort of brief and short and sweet. Thank you. My name is Jason Welsh. I'm just a retired Yankee living in Fearington Village. So <laughs> Bravo, yeah. I'm interested in world affairs. From my distant vantage point, uh, it appears to me that many of our problems and what we're trying to do in Afghanistan are roadblocked or at least undermined by the illiterate nature of the predominance of the population. Can you talk a little bit mm. about what the literacy level is of the countries under your wheel, so to speak? It's higher than in the United States, in every one of the countries. Wow. So that is not an issue. I mean, it's very interesting that you bring that up because that's, that's a, a true challenge. Um, what you face in, in former Yugoslavia was a very well-educated. Now, what they were educated in and, and the sort of legacy of a communist era and uh, some of the underlying cultural biases that, that emerged uh, with the breakup of Yugoslavia, that they still live with as well. But in terms of the basics, uh, you know, literacy, as you, as you mentioned, um, very high levels of literacy, which it sometimes makes it almost all the more frustrating uh, that in some cases, Bosnia is a good example, that the citizenry are so passive and so easily stuck in the same old routine, the party loyalties. Um, and I think it's something that may be increasingly frustrating for them. And you may begin to see changes with um, social media and other outlets um, very high uh, internet penetration throughout the former Yugoslavia and, and in Albania as well, which means slowly over time some of these messages may change, and I think some of the leaders are already cognizant of that. Um, but it's interesting that you, you make the comparison. When I served in, in Baghdad, um, was, the Secretary of State asked me to go uh, work with Ambassador Crocker, and I kept saying, I don't know anything about the Middle East. I, I'm a Europe guy, a Balkans guy. So that didn't get me very far. And they made me go anyway. And you know, you get out there and you, 
you inform yourself with what you know. And what I realized in Iraq, where literacy is actually very high, uh, unlike Afghanistan, um, you had a similar challenge. You had a society that was fractured, um, so shattered, so broken by uh, the Saddam Hussein regime, and, and it was sort of shattered glass in a mirror. And when we came in and broke the frame of it, all that glass fell into pieces on the ground. And how do you put that back together again? So the challenge I faced, I said, well, you know, this is really just a lot like the Balkans. Yugoslavia broke apart and it, it shattered and we were trying to put it back together, a new frame for it. And so I treated it like that, a bigger, meaner, tougher Balkans. Um, and uh, at least it was one way. It wasn't necessarily the solution, but, but that was it. A population that has great potential in Iraq, well-educated, great resources. If you think about the, the wealth of the country that just needs to get itself together and understand how to work with all those tribal, religious, ethnic differences. Thank you. So you've alluded several times to this ethnicity issue. And uh, one of the things that seems to me it's tough for Americans to understand is you know, the strength of the ethnicity. And I'm wondering if it hasn't taken sort of the threat of some kind of military power or a dictator to hold them together. And mm -hmm. then you know, they're together for years, and then as soon as that threat goes away, they erupt into you know, whether it's uh, you know, that bad area or now the Sunnis and the Shiites and so forth. And I guess so my question is, is, is there any progress that you see on a grassroots level where people are starting to become more tolerant or in the families, are they still saying, you know, these guys are called uh, more criminals, but they're heroes. And, yeah. and so the kids are still coming up with the exact same prejudices. And one thing before you comment, yeah. if, if, um, if Macedonia can't become the 51st state, some of us would be willing to trade Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I won't touch that one. Um. <laughs> It's, it's actually, you mentioned that and... Could you briefly identify yourself? Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, I'm uh, Brian Bailick, a uh, retired uh, professor of medicine from here, from the U.S. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's just since you mentioned that, that story of uh, how many people signed a petition that Texas should uh, secede, um, that was picked up very widely uh, in Europe. It was a, a, a major story in a number of the Balkan countries where I <laughs> serve. Uh, they say, you see, you're just, uh, you're just like we are. Um, <laughs> I, I think um, these are long and difficult uh, issues. I mean, these are embedded issues, these inter-ethnic issues, um, where there's been some progress made. My own philosophy is that these things are not innate to people. That, that you know, you're not born with racism or ethnic biases. Um, but they do take generations to overcome, and it takes a positive effort to do that. And they can easily be brought back because they're based on fear, the most uh, destructive human emotion, fear. And you know, it, if you go back and, and you look at the studies that were done uh, after uh, the, the wars ended in, in Yugoslavia and the sort of um, trying to uh, uh, rec reconcile. Um, you know, you ask people in villages, look, you, you live next door to these guys and you saw the birth of their children and their grandchildren. You went to their weddings. You went to special events. You nursed them. You shared parties together. What happened that you, you killed them in many cases? You go to a place like Srebrenica you massacred them. And it was the idea that, you know, the idea was planted and the fear was there that if, if I don't do it to him first, he'll do it to me. And certain leaders, political agendas, ha have used that and they did it. You, could, you can trace it to what happened in Yugoslavia. With the death of Tito and the emergence, the, the, that, that strong arm that had brought them together and, and made the country broadly successful, although not in a democratic form, um, you could see people struggling. Who was going to power and money? Who was going to benefit? And that's where these nationalist tendencies came. Uh, so Milosevic and others used that and stirred the fear. Um, and that's why we have to speak out against nationalism in a negative way. Patriotism has a role in any country. And you can see it. It's a palpable 
uh, emotion. It's important for little countries uh, to feel proud for the people to rally around something. And that's one of the challenges that the European Union faces too, is creating a, a pan-European context without trying to suggest that individual uh, country affiliations and pride are, are any less important. But what sort of patriotism is good? What sort of nationalism, patriotism is, is bad? I mean, where do you draw the line? It, you know, it's, it's not for us to say, but if you just look at experience, uh, um, I think we're, uh, we're dealing with it right now in the Albanian uh, elections, a difficult political climate where the current uh, party in power is behind in the polls desperately trying to seek votes. There have emerged some new parties that have a, a nationalist platform. Uh, people are disenchanted with uh, the experience they've had with the current party. They're not impressed with the opposition party. They're looking for something different. And some people have emerged who, who's, who have pushed sort of pan-Albanianism, that we should be, uh, Albanians in Albania shouldn't be happy enough. Well, we should look for other Albanians, we should merge with Kosovo, we should, they, they promote these ideas. Um, that is dangerous, where you start talking about changing borders, where you start uh, talking about some sort of, uh, somebody is superior to a, another, where you move away from the idea uh, that every citizen is equal under law, where rule of law is what should determine and not your ethnicity or your religion. That's where you start having some dangers, and I think that's where we as an international community have to speak out uh, and stand up for that. We have challenges in our own country, and that's what I always try to tell uh, overseas audiences. Is that, look, the United States is, is not perfect. We, are, we have gone through 200 and, what are we up to now? 30 years uh, of experience under a single constitution. Quite remarkable. Has that constitution remained constant over time? Well, no. We have, we have amended that constitution to move with the time. And uh, one of the things I often carry around is this. I uh, wasn't sure if I had it today, but you know, I take this everywhere I go. Constitution of the United States to show uh, people, particularly in the Balkans, that this is, look how small it is, how straightforward, how basic. Uh, you know, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. Well, we've never said, okay, we're done. It's perfect. It's a constant 200 plus year exercise in this. And that's what I try to tell them, whether it's in Macedonia, which has been independent for 20 years. Uh, you know, come on guys, this is a constant effort and it takes uh, dedication and above all, overcoming fear. Thanks very much. Please. Please. My Swedish friend. Yourself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Johan Hassel, a Swedish a transatlantic master student here in political science. Uh, the Balkan wars are gradually involved. It's had an enormous push for European integration, mainly in the fields of foreign policy and uh, defense policy, and later on the enlargement also had a push for European integration. How do you say that stands today? Is I mean the integration of Western Balkans still a push for European integration, as we're from a European and from an American perspective, mm -hmm. going between the Balkans and Brussels? And is that maybe underestimated? What is it that we could you know, pick up from a European integration perspective as a positive approach uh, to the Balkans, which is mainly seen still 20 years after mainly of ethnic war and, and those services? So a different perspective. No, it's, a, it's a, a very good question, and it's one that we have to constantly re-examine, because if the basis of our policy, of US policy, is to embrace and, and support and encourage uh, integration into transatlantic structures, which means EU and NATO, uh, if that's not viable, or if that suddenly isn't what people want, then we, then we, we have to be rethinking uh, what are we going to approach. There's been undoubtedly some uh, slowing down of the process. First of all, a number of countries quickly joined. Slovenia quickly joined uh, the European Union. Other countries in Central Europe that had emerged from uh, the Warsaw Pact uh, from the uh, Soviet sphere, uh, joined the EU. It was widely praised. There was excitement about it, enthusiasm. They undertook the reforms. And understandably, that wanes after a while. I think with um, the accession of Romania and Bulgaria to the EU, uh, some felt it was too quick, that the two countries weren't ready yet, that, okay, they had met criteria under some people's interpretation, but their economies, 
their societies weren't quite ready uh, to integrate, and it was costly. Corruption still reigned. Um, but it, all of those things are somewhat subjective. Uh, and then you entered this area of, um, of economic challenge. And whether it's Germany or just about any other European country, you're not going to find a lot of politicians, uh, elected members of parliaments, who are going to campaign on the idea of European enlargement. We're going to bring in more people into the European Union. And wealthier countries like Germany, probably Sweden, who are net contributors and are, are paying more in than they feel they're getting back out to help these countries. I mean, look at the example of Greece. Greece is, after all, geographically a Balkan country. It's the, it's the most Balkan country. Uh, and some people would say uh, their experience in the European Union, in the Eurozone in particular, having joined the Euro under what turned out to be false pretenses, their record keeping was um, a little creative. Um, <laughs> It was an example they don't want to go over again. So we're entering a period of, of, of that. That frustration is seen in, in these countries in the Western Balkans who want to say, well, why aren't we moving ahead? Uh, Macedonia has a problem to move ahead with Greece, but their own reform process has, has slowed down and in some cases has, has done some backsliding. Kosovo, we're independent now. Can't we join the European Union tomorrow? Um, you have to balance this and try to keep people's uh, eye on the ball, to use an overused uh, phrase. So it is a, a challenge. Um, but what I find underneath, because I ask this question all the time, is with all the other things going on in the world, is this still relevant? And, and we find it is. Uh, if you look at John Kerry's confirmation hearing, Senator Shaheen asked him a question. She said, Senator, with all the other things going on in the world, let's not forget about the Balkans, where we invested so much just 20 years ago, and we have so much unfinished business. Is this still a priority for you? And John Kerry said yes. I point that out to my friends in the Balkans. Are you the top priority? No. Should they be? No. Do I uh, get upset that Secretary Clinton wasn't calling me up to talk about the Balkans every day? Absolutely not. I knew of her interest. I knew of her dedication to engaging when it made a difference, to taking that trip to deliver some key messages uh, in those countries that hopefully helps us move forward. Uh, but it's just a, a slow, slow, steady process that sometimes has some steps backwards, too. Thank you. I think what the EU needs is a rich country, like Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> Over there. Uh, my name is Hans Hegeman, I'm a retired Dutch diplomat and I served a couple of years on the Belgrade uh, Embassy uh, covering Serbia, Kosovo and Montenegro. Yeah. Retired Dutch diplomat? A retired Dutch diplomat. Bravo. Um, I fully share, Mr. Ambassador, your, uh, let's say, uh, question marks and your doubt about the speedy process of uh, involvement of the European Union. Uh, it takes two to tango, and uh, I think we learned our lessons with other countries. So uh, the eagerness of the public in our democracies is not so large, uh, as long as things uh, keep quiet, fine with us. Um, I have, however, a, a question about Serbia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, recently, or a year ago, Mr. Mikulic was elected president of Serbia. Now, he was uh, a very close uh, staff member of Mr. Milosevic, yeah. uh, which went to the aid for, uh, for, for war crimes and so on. So how do you interpret uh, his election? Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great question. And, and Serbia is, as you know, uh, critical to the region. It's still the largest country in the region. Uh, has the, the largest economy, um, and a lot of people would say, I think, with, with uh, good justification, that the future of the region really depends on, on how Serbia evolves. Uh, the elections last May um, were a surprise to many when Boris Tadic, who was in some ways, uh, some have described him as the darling of, of the West, he was a, a reformed uh, Democrat, he did a lot of, of remarkable things to help uh, transform 
uh, Serbia from the difficult days after the, the Balkan Wars, uh, where really, let's face it, Serbia had the status of sort of a pariah state. Uh, he delivered war criminals um, onto the International uh, Criminal Tribunal in The Hague, Karadzic, Mladic. Um, it was difficult. I think maybe after it was done, he realized it perhaps wasn't as difficult or as, as traumatic as he thought. Um, but he was also a flawed uh, character in, in my view. Uh, I've met him many times. I have a great deal of respect for him. But I think he had reached a point where his country was feeling frustrated. His, his citizens were feeling that things weren't moving fast enough. Um, he was extraordinarily uh, bound up over the Kosovo issue and was constantly playing games with that instead of just saying, all right, we've got to make some tough decisions. Let's rip off the Band-Aid and, and move forward here. He called elections uh, early. He didn't have to run for uh, re-election, but he decided to uh, throw his hat in and have early presidential elections, and he lost. He lost to Nikolic, this right-wing guy who says things uh, even now that sometimes just sort of <laughs> make your head spin. Um, the story that was was missed, I think, because all of us were shocked. Uh, how did Tadic lose, and what does this mean? Is this a huge setback for Serbia? The election was free and fair. All the international observers gave it the seal of approval, which is a rare thing in the Balkans. And the transition of power after a long period and, and really quite a shock of an election was smooth and flawless. And you had an emergence of a coalition. Uh, Mr. Nikolic is the president, so he's more of a figurehead uh, and says some very unhelpful things, particularly on the subject of Kosovo. But what you've seen is that the coalition government is actually engaging and I think taking more seriously without some of the games that we had under Tadic, who was the great hope. And so it just proves once again, you can never be sure. You have to constantly work with what you're given and see where it goes. Uh, and there's an opportunity here. Sometimes, and it's a rule in the Balkans as it is other places, the guy on the far right, the guy with the nationalist rhetoric, he's the one that's able to do some of these tougher things. Because no one is really going to be able to question the patriotism of Tome Nikolic or Ivica Dacic, the prime minister, his coalition partner. And so if he makes these decisions and determines to take some of the political hits, but to shift the narrative so that uh, he can convince his people what real leadership is about. Shift that narrative, say, come with me, this is the way for a better future for everyone in Serbia. I think there could be a, a real success. So it's an unfinished story. You have to wait for what's next, but uh, the next couple of months are, are very critical on, on the Kosovo front. And um, in the meantime, we just keep telling Nikolic to Smile, smile a little more. He's a particularly dour guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. We've got time for one or two more questions. There was one here. Yeah. Sure. I'll get these two up there. Yeah. Um, my name is Amina. I'm a former civil servant at State Department. Great. And uh, my question is about the, the United Kingdom's decision in the future to um, leave the European Union and what does that mean for the European Union um, and what's to keep other European countries from following in their footsteps? Well, let me make sure that, just to clarify, they have made no such decision. Uh, what Prime Minister Cameron said in his speech uh, last week was that his pledge was if he's reelected in 2015, uh, they have to have an election by that time, uh, then his pledge as of now, and let's remember we're talking politicians here, so we don't know how things evolve, but his, his idea would be to promote, that would be part of his platform, that there would be a, a referendum uh, on the question of the UK's future in the European Union uh, by around 2017. That was kind of the time frame that was uh, put out there. This has been an issue for a long time. I mean, the whole history of the UK's uh, engagement with the European Union has been fairly complex. Uh, they never have joined the Eurozone, for instance, or even the Schengen uh, arrangement in terms of um, uh, visa-free uh, travel and, and uh, free travel within the European Union. So nothing is, is set. Our policy, our position, which has actually been the same for 
about 50 years, uh, people thought there was some new development. But in fact, we've always said the same thing. We support a strong United Kingdom and a strong European Union. And we think that's good for, for both of them. They're going to make their own decisions just like any other country about joining or, in theory, leaving the European Union. But I think people need to educate themselves fully on the implications of that and what, what that means. Our belief is, if you look at, at the history of Europe over any period of time, is that the European Union, for all its flaws, like anything else, uh, has really given an opportunity, first by, by helping preserve peace, uh, and then creating um, not just sometimes frustrating bureaucracy, but, but creating a sphere of prosperity the current couple of years aside, uh, that's unprecedented and unexpected. That, that is, is the best way forward to deal in an increasingly competitive world. How do you deal with competing with China? How do you deal with the other emerging countries, the Brazils, the, even Russia, um, you know, India? This is uh, uh, the real questions. And so that's what UK voters uh, are going to face just like potentially Scottish voters are going to face if they have a referendum about the future of the United Kingdom in itself. A lot of people are stunned by that. What is it, 300 years uh, since uh, united Scotland and, and England? Uh, would they really choose to devolve in, in some way? Um, so there are lots of implications in that. It consumes lots of uh, thinking, but I think we just have to see and, and hope that people are fully informed and fully educated when they take those uh, steps. And, and referenda can be tricky things. Our own founding fathers understood. That's why we have an electoral college. Uh, it's for better and worse. Uh, it's why we are technically a republic and not a pure uh, Athenian democracy. Um, because leadership is sometimes required, and, and um, some people would say that leaders have to sometimes protect people from themselves. Thank you. And of course, before the referendum, Cameron still has to win the general election in 2015. <laughs> right. Maybe a bit of a problem, so there may never be a referendum. Yeah. 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 Some other questions. This gentleman over there. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Mary Gray, and I'm a retired staff member. Uh, two cultural questions. In 1990, I went to, uh, on a tour, we went to Split, and of course we went to Dubai and uh, offered Yugoslavia right before the war. Yeah. And uh, all the villages seemed to be clustered in Slovenia around the church. And they had two different types of towers. My question, the first part of my question is, you have an onion dome and you have a straight steeple. Which was the Orthodox and which was the Catholic? We could never tell the difference. G generally, an onion one would be Orthodox, um, and steeples would be Catholic, although there are, there are variations throughout. And some of that is because some of the oldest uh, religious structures have gone through being church, mosque, church under one, <laughs> one form of Christianity, uh, then under a different one. Um, it's remarkable. <laughs> Uh, how much in a place like Macedonia you can see something that was built uh, as a church as early as the 8th or 9th century. Uh, when the Ottomans came in, it became a mosque uh, and then was turned back into a church again later on. So. And, and the final question is, we noticed the villagers, uh, it's very interesting, of course it's 1990 before the changes, but everyone was driving, the peasants were all driving these hay wagons pulled by horses. Yeah. They all had rubber tires, truck <laughs> tires. And uh, the women of the villages were hanging out on the sides of the roads with these big scythes, trimming, trimming grass, three or four. We assumed they were maybe planning future marriages or weddings or something. <laughs> yeah. And I guess my question is, do you think that the introduction of portable string trimmers might change social policy? <laughs> Well, things have evolved a little bit since, since 1990. Uh, I envy you because I never visited uh, Yugoslavia until after uh, or the wars were already underway. Um, and I would have loved to have seen it when it was still Yugoslavia. I've never actually been to 
uh, Yugoslavia as it was. Uh, it had broken up into to different uh, pieces since then. Um, there is still, uh, you know, you don't have to go too far to see some pretty rustic uh, scenes, um, which is, I guess, what gives it some of the charm. Uh, certainly the coast, coastline of uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Montenegro, uh, and outside of Yugoslavia, but Albania is quite spectacular. I recommend it to, uh, to anybody. Dubrovnik uh, is, is still an absolute gem. Uh, and there are other places all along the, the coast that are beautiful. And, and don't just stick to the coast. Uh, inland has some remarkable things to see. Macedonia, where I served uh, for three years and then earlier in the 90s for a couple of years, uh, has no sea coast, but it has a couple of absolutely beautiful lakes, Lake Ohrid, uh, Lake Prespa, um, with uh, archaeological, really wonderful sites, Roman, Roman cities that have been excavated. Um, and extremely friendly people throughout. Mm -hmm. They're all driving BMWs <laughs> thanks to the EU. <laughs> <laughs> My name is um, Monty Barnett. I'm an alumni in National Studies, and I had a successful career in national business. Okay. So I have an economics question for you. Um, economic health, political health, kind of hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that a lot of the more European countries and the businesses within them are not looking forward to um, less stable economic countries moving into easy. Mm -hmm. So could you just comment very briefly on, on the health, the current health right now of, of the Balkan countries and where you see that going and how that may drive or slow down their ability to join the EU? Oh, it's, a, it's a great question because when it comes down to it, the fundamental issue in all of these things in terms of political stability uh, is economics. Um, and you're absolutely right, uh, Northern Europeans, others don't want to necessarily take in countries that are going to be burdens again, drains. I mean, EU membership, uh, one of the things that makes it so appealing uh, is that it comes with enormous amounts of assistance, stabilization funds to try to bring everybody to a, a, a more equal level. Uh, and you can imagine, that particularly in these economic times, uh, Germans, uh, German citizens, let alone their politicians, are maybe not so thrilled at, at the prospect of that. So economic growth is critical. The reforms to the economy are critical to make that growth happen. Uh, and you saw some real positive steps in Macedonia, which I know the best. Uh, they really made some major reforms. Uh, a lot of it in line with the EU accession process. The EU gives a framework and says, here's what you have to do. And we help through our programs to help them meet those criteria. When their uh, accession process was blocked, when they'd been a candidate country for five years, and the European Commission recommended that they move into the next phase, that is formally start the accession negotiations chapter by chapter, uh, as other countries have done to, to ultimately become a member, um, that was blocked because of this, this problem with uh, the name. And, and, and Greece said, no, we, we can't support that. Everything ground to a halt in Macedonia. The, the reform process stopped. And this was coincidentally the same time that the global economic downturn hit everybody. It hit some of these places that are not mainstream economies a little bit later. So they had had a lot of growth. They had seen a lot of foreign investment that started to dry up. The reforms went back. Uh, some of the democratic reforms where there was backsliding as well. Um, so this just means the, the process is, is, um, is slowed down. Uh, and we try to encourage the politicians in the countries and, and their citizens to support sticking with that process. So for that, it's, you know, there's, there's two directions, as you say. The, the Europeans have to demonstrate we're serious about this. Yes, you have a serious chance so that if you do these things, these reforms, you will move forward. Uh, and at the same time, they need to, to the, the aspirant countries need to make the reforms uh, to happen. And it's a hard sell to citizens who are looking for, just like in this country, instant gratification. You got four years, and then there's going to be another election. And we want to see, am I better off than I was four years ago? So. I think we have to thank you for giving us a great overview. Pleasure. Thanks. Good question. Thanks very much. Good question. Yeah.